Welcome to this talk on uh, that RIP value, what to do. Or I just thought another title for it. It's that time I saw Cilium and eBPF crash the kernel. So I'm Shong Si Yu, and I'm a kernel engineer at SUSE Lab, part of the hardware enablement Taipei team under Joy Lee. And I work on BPF in the kernel. About this talk. So this talk, I'm presenting a case more than one year ago when the kernel crashed inside the BPF program. And the major problem is that there's no reliable stack trace. So I'll talk about what, how I diagnose it and what's the root cause. Also, hopefully at the end or during the talk, we can discuss what kind of approach are better for it. So let's begin. This, uh, this bug is 1185302 where the it's a kernel bur where the error code is bad RIP value. So the kernel log looks something like this. The kernel complained that there's a bad RIP value. And RIP is actually the register of the CPU for instruction pointer. And in this case, it was set to zero. And because it's the instruction pointer, one of the consequences that the stack trace was not reliable. So we also see stack trace in the IP finish output or something of scattered slice. But anyway, we were able to identify that it's always, there's always a class BPF classify function being called. And with that, the user also reported that this also really happened when he uses Cilium. So Cilium is a container network interface that's powered by eBPF. So with this knowledge, we come to a conclusion that this should be something that's BPF related and begin debugging. The first thing we try is to debug BPF with BPF itself. So there's uh, this BCC, BPF compiler collection that helps us create script for tracing. So we try to trace this class BPF classify function and capture its runtime argument. The script looks something like this. It's kind of like a friendlier version of KPro. And with that, we're actually able to kind of change the behavior a bit and stabilize the stack trace. So we see this class BPF classify more often and it's closer to the top of the code trace. But one of the problem is that BCC prints out the result in the user space. So it's kind of hard for us to make sure that uh, if we really got the last call argument captured. So to work around this issue, we turn to something else. We use F trace and trace point. So we still want to trace this class BPF classify. And, but this time we are using trace point to trace it. And the trace point itself is actually quite easy. It's a bit more line of code compared to BCC, but it's not that dif uh, not that difficult. And we just add the trace point call to the code and recompile the kernel. And then we can begin recording the uh, the call with trace point using F trace. And one of the trick we use here is to use this F trace dump on whoops uh, command line argument to the kernel. And this helps the kernel, this tells the kernel to dump the F trace buffer on whoops. And this is quite useful. So the next time there's an whoops, we actually see the argument that's given to class BPF classify. And we begin looking at the SKB buffer. So it's the packet data because initially we suspect that it might be related to something in the packet. But after dumping and inspection the data, it's the packet turned out to be pretty normal. It's nothing that special. So we still have something else to look at, luckily. We have the BPF program pointer. So we can look at the BPF program that's being executed along with the BPF program that it calls into. 
And quite luckily, Crash has some command that allow dumping the BPF program so we can begin inspecting. So that now it's time to look into the whole thing. It's kind of like finding a needle in the haystack. So on one hand, I have all the register state. On the other, I have the instruction that might have been executed by the CPU. So there's a lot of head, straight, uh, head scratching and looking here and there. And after many hours of looking, I finally found that it's the execution flow seemed to be right at a helper call for a BPF tail call. And there are actually two of the sites that I could match. So they are both doing a BPF tail call using the same argument. But one of them is looking pretty weird. So there's an int3 here. So what, why does this site has an int3 instruction there? Well, now we can talk about the root cause. So I search for int3, and a familiar name comes up. So the int3 is actually a breakpoint-based instruction patching mechanism. And the reason that we need instruction patching is because BPF is just uh, just in time compiled, and it will translate the indirect call, which is the BPF tail call, into a jump instruction. So it goes to the program directly. And one thing about the BPF tail call is that the target of the call may change. So to deal with that, uh, to keep performance and have JIT, we use instruction patching to patch the exact jump instructions that does the uh, that that does the call. And the way this is done is that the kernel will first switch the first byte of the instruction that it wants to patch into n3. Then it will update the rest of the part, and then finally, when the rest part is updated, it can replace an int3 instruction with something that should be there. So we are stuck somewhere between here when the kernel crashes. So what went wrong? Actually, what went wrong seems to be like this. So on CPU 0, there's a BPF tail call being patched. Then another CPU arrives at that exact site that's being patched. So there's an N3 there, and CPU 1 goes to the N3 handler. But the rest of those is actually fake to me. I, I kind of got stuck. But luckily, uh, some user also opened another issue, encountered the same thing, and was able to get a bit of a better stack trace. And with bisect, he got down to the exact comment. And with that commit, one of our colleagues actually blind shot to the exact patch that's missing. So that's how the bug was solved, not by me, but luckily by, by one of our colleagues. So what happened is that after CPU1 goes through the N3 handler, the, the handler actually tried to redirect the execution flow back. And to re change the execution flow is changing the RIP. Unfortunately, because we're missing one of the commit, the RIP got set to null, and that blew everything up. So this is now the discussion part. So if you have any question or uh, anything else, you could raise it right now, or I could just continue. OK. So let me continue with the discussion. So what worked in my case? I think what one of the things that helped me is uh, to compare and contrast. So I was lucky enough there, there's two call site of BPO telco, and one looks different. So that really helped. And I think trying to trace with ftrace with custom trace point and then the dump on whoops actually is very helpful because it helped me pinpoint to the exact BPF program. And then there's the painstakingly reconstructing the 
stack trace by looking the instruction and the register state. And there's many other major factors that help. So I was able to have access to a reproducible machine because the reporter was part of SUSE and he was kind enough to provide me the access credential. And also he also suggested some workaround and some way to reproduce. For example, Cilium, uh, if we replace Cilium with something else, it doesn't happen. And he also suggests that the issue seems to be occur more often during the reboot. So that really helped. And thirdly, so we have a power user that find the exact commit that causes trouble. And lastly, we have a great colleague who's at, great at doing blind shot. So that really helped. And so now it's part that what could have been done if I, I encountered this issue again. I hope not, but if I do, um, something I might try is to see if I can capture the CPU's last branch record. So CPU has some Intel CPU, or I think ARM and AMD maybe has it as well, but it can have a small buffer to capture the recent jump or something like basically how the instruction pointer changes. So if I have that, maybe things would be much easier for me to develop. And the other thing I might try is to use maybe some symbolic execution framework. So by using some symbolic execution framework, I can mimic the execution of BPM program and then compare each, so step through the program, then compare each state with the actual register state I have. So that may help me come to finding the exact call site when the execution flow stopped much easier. And that's actually it. So I was hoping maybe some, like, I just hope there will be more, well, yeah, any discussion is welcome. That's what I mean. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so do we have any questions? I do see people typing in, in the chat. So Flasimios asks, uh, could Crash Python have helped with reconstructing Paul stack? Uh, I, I haven't tried yet, but I, I would hope it does. If, if it does, it would be great. And Easy says, I vaguely recall some of the Intel CPU had some kind of flight recorder that contains last few executed instruction and internal state. But I forgot whether it's actually came to existence or it was just a prototype. Yeah, I think I think if like in, in this case if we can rely on some kind of CPU built in recorder, it will be really great. And it seems like CPU does have this function. So, so I was also wondering if it's possible to to have some patch submitted that 
um, kernel whoops. Um, yeah, if, on kernel whoops, the the instruction, the branch record gets printed. I'm not sure if that's possible. And I'm also not sure if that branch record is turned on by default or or it's something that I have to set explicitly. So Giovanni said it's, there's an Intel processor trace. Kind of long, but but I think it sounds sounds like it. I think there's also one. There's one. Uh, LWN article, so the the one that link here talks a bit more on how it can be used in the Linux kernel. But I think, if I remember correctly, it's more focused on uh, on when the the CP, the CPU is in the right state. So I'm not sure. Like, can are we able to use this? Uh, during kernel whoops. Oh, okay. So, so the process trace processes trace is actually different from last branch record. Might uh, Giovanni suggest this? So it might be different. So I guess I, I also have a question to the audience. Like, when looking at how people debug crash, like, is there some way that you can, uh, y you're able to tell which register come from where, or is it just like going backward and trying to analyze where the register is last written? Because it, for me, it's always just trying to look backward, and it's actually quite hard. It's quite easy to get get lost. So maybe Crash Python has something to help here. No idea about Crash Python, but I think I've done some of this before, and uh, it usually comes down to is the stack pointer corrupted? If not, you have a stack trace, and I think I begin below below the bottommost function with a question mark and work up from there and basically reading the disassembly of each function to figure out how large the stack frame is so you basically have have this uh, this uh, information for each stack frame that's above, above above the point and i think this should allow you to weed out those entries that are not the actual stack frame mm -hmm. and i guess I worked with a hex dump of the stack. So yes, I, I do not mind reading hex dumps, but yeah, I, I always struggle with the the hex yeah. dump. Hex dumps and dis the disassembly of each function. And this should give you a picture if you then, uh, because the disassembly will tell you what's supposed to be on the stack. And if you look at the stack, then you can compare what you expect to be there depending on, on what's happening. So you should even get some of the arguments to the function you were investigating. I guess they would be on the stack somewhere, but it really depends. It's case by case. And then if that was an escape buff, you could then look this up. If this was still allocated, I guess it mm -hmm. was because it crashed during processing this, this buffer. So yeah, I yes, I think the methods are laborious. It's not easy. I think in, in another bug, which is, so not this one, but 
I think last time I tried to look up the stack frame, I got quite confused because I assumed that we have the uh, the stack pointer available or or some or the frame pointer. I always got confused, but we I think we actually have orc we're used so we don't have some we're not recording one of the i guess it's a frame pointer yes we're either. actually using the orc unwinder for the unwinding so last time i tried to unwind myself i got really confused yeah yeah and we use the frame pointer the rbp for as a general register because it's mm. uh, the it has some performance advantage but the unwinding is more complex before because of yeah. but i i think in crash python uh, because it uh, incorporates the gdb unwinding better than crash it, it could help you with Telling you what what are in what registers, unless it's all optimized out. Okay. And and maybe if uh, maybe the problem with your unwinding in this case was that the uh, the rip was destroyed. I don't know about the RSP register if it was also wrong, uh, so the unwinder could not start from a known state uh, but yeah, maybe with that... crash python you could like somehow fake how it should look like and it, it could go from there maybe yeah sounds like i'm i'm actually just now you bring it up i'm also interested in what's what's the rsp Uh, well, uh, even in Crash, you can uh, force the values of IP and SP registers. It's, I think, dash capital I and dash capital S parameters of the command. Could you, could you type it in, in the chat? Uh, that, that's something I've been using for Xen uh, Crash dumps where the stack traces of active processes were not uh, shown correctly. Okay, all right. So that will give you the real stack and not all the noise in there with the question marks, right? But we will not get the like local variables because Crash's unwinder doesn't have that. So BT command, oh, dash, dash, okay, BT, BT command has the dash, capital I, capital S. Oh, cool, okay, so, so with, with that, I can force the RIP and RSP register value. Yeah, so if, if you can guess what would be the correct values if there wasn't uh -huh. a bug, then you could unwind with that. All right, that, that that's actually quite cool. I, I have no idea. Yeah, I think it will, it will really help in this case. Uh, yes, uh, there, there's one more point, I think, uh, to get your bearings on where, where you are on the stack. You could use the entry code, for example, uh, because kernel entry code uh, just dumps all, all the all the registers onto the stack, and th there's a specific sequence to this. And uh, th there's the one of them is all ones, I guess. So you you could get your bearings if you if you spot this, for example, if if you had a corrupted RSP value. And there are no guarantees to you cannot tell if it's corrupted or not that's that's the problem okay
Yeah, so I, I think definitely need to learn a bit more on about Crash or and also try Crash Python. And I think one one thing that I couldn't explain was that the the BPF uh, program actually is is within the K all all sim. So on um, so supposedly. The, the stack trace should contain the BPF program name, and it, that somehow didn't show up in mine. But in the other, and the other user, it's there is something. Let me paste it. So for the So in theory, I, I should suppose to get something like this pasted in chat. So the BPF program actually has the, it, it has a symbol in the KL sim. So theoretically, I should, like if the unwind is successful, uh, I should see like BPF underscore prog underscore and its ID. And I think I, I was especially unlucky in, in my case that it didn't show up. And I think one, one, well, one, one thing that's kind of hard with this issue is that, that the the depend. So we're missing one of the patch in the x86, and the dependency is not really that obvious. So it's, it's I guess that's like the the reason behind all this. But I guess that's that's just kind of hard with backporting. And even if I knew the d dependency, I, I probably would be a bit like even if I think there may be a dependency, I I'm not sure. I maybe I need to. So I still need to CC one of our colleague for backport. And to be honest, like like in hindsight, I could say there's a dependency, but looking at actually right now, if I look at the BPF patch that's causing the issue i still couldn't tell what's what's wrong with that so yeah i think maybe i need to learn a bit about x86 and arm architecture because with with bpf a lot of part is kind of intertwined with the architecture part because there's the instruction patching and there's the tracing and and yeah, probably more.
uh, yeah, I, I was looking at the at the bug now because I was interested how I came to that lucky guess. <laughs> I think it was uh, it was related to the null detour pointer in the structure that was mentioned in uh, comment eight. Yes, so yes. I was interested why it was not filled with this uh, meaningful value. And when comment, uh, comment nine identified the offending commit, then I probably realized that that commit came from times when there was no detour member uh -huh. of the structure anymore. So then it was the question of finding out when did that detour member disappear. Uh, so that, that was probably how I came to that particular commit. That, that because from, apparently the problem was that the detour pointer was null in the structure, but the text poke uh, mechanism expected it to have some meaningful value. And then I realized that the offending commit was backported from later code when there was no longer a detour pointer. So it apparently did not handle it because it had nothing to do with it. So that that's probably how I came to that lucky guess. Uh, then I wouldn't call it lucky because I, 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 even if I look at this, I would have, I would have no idea. Yeah, but but I, I guess it's quite lucky that one of the user is like a like very advanced and powerful user that was able to bisect to to the exact commit. Uh, yeah, that's probably the, the lucky part for us. And I guess just a, just a side note, I, I really, I think uh, F trace is really powerful in terms of in terms of debugging. Like even though I work on BPF, I, I actually like F trace a lot. The the only problem seems to be that you need to have a trace point in order to capture the the arguments. But if you have that, it's like, it's really great because you have dump on loops. And also one thing that BPF trace couldn't do or BPF couldn't really yet do is to begin tracing at the very, very early stage of boot. And that's one thing that that's make uh, F trace still superior in terms of BP, like compared to BPF trace for debugging those issue that occurs very early at the start or some memory allocation allocating issue because you want to start tracing as early as possible. Yeah. Uh, we recently had a bug where we tried to use ftrace enabled by command line, uh, boot kernel command line to catch early allocations. And it seems it wasn't still early enough. <laughs> But certainly, it's earlier than running uh, user space, where uh, so you can install your BPF. Yeah. Program. I I think there is some way to run BPF as early as possible. There's some I think within the Linux kernel source, there's an example of how how you can build a kernel module that loads BPF. So you don't need, I think you, you don't need that much user space up to load the BPF, but it's still later than F trace. So of course for, for, for memory, it's probably way, way, way too late.
so I guess like we're probably out of question for now. And if there's uh, and maybe like two more minutes until we uh, close the until we stop the recording, I guess. I really have no idea how to how to hold a discussion. Like, is, is this usually how it goes, or or like I know there's a Kate build discussion. I think yesterday. I have no idea how like how is it held held. Uh, one thing I think you mentioned that uh, it's you did not quite uh, do. Uh, fetching arguments uh, with f trace arguments to functions without a trace point uh, i don't think that's particularly difficult um mm -hmm. it depends what you're interested in uh you put either you can do that even at the kernel command line you can either put a k probe at the beginning at the start of a function in which case you, you would be interested in, in the registers um, on, on Intel, RDI, RSI, and so on. And I get, or you could even put a probe into a function with a non-zero offset. I've done all of this. Uh, it works quite well. You just have to read the disassembly of the function to know what you're interested in. You can read from the stack. You can interpret numbers, you know, the usual stuff. So. I have good experience with this, and F-Trace works in this respect very well. Oh, OK. So yeah, I have no idea that. So you mean you can, without recompiling the kernel, just by giving the kernel boot command line, you can put like uh, some event type that's kpro mm -hmm. and what what register you wanted to print? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK. And it so, yeah, can that... break into a function even doesn't have to be at the beginning i don't think you you might even be able to define red probes but uh, i don't think you care about red probes at this point you just need a k probe and print some register values yes. or dereference pointers and print members of structs and you can have multiple dereferences this supports it uh, supports it as well so you could have a pointer to an object which has a pointer to another object and you could print a member th from the other object no problem at all oh, okay. just got to know what the alignment is which offsets to use it's it's a bit it, it's a little bother, bothersome but nothing insurmountable right. so that's yeah that's definitely something i should try if, so so i i actually don't need to recom recompile the kernel in this case which is nice to know. Thank you. 